and Happy New Year! Welcome to our very first service for the year 2016. We're glad that so many of you are able to come and join us today. Um, we decided to take a break from our series in the Book of Romans, and we're going to go through uh, this set of texts today because, well, it's New Year. And during New Year's time, what's the most common thing that normally people will make? New Year's resolutions. Yes, New Year's resolutions. Can you guess, according to Google, what are the top three areas that a person makes resolutions for every single year? Diet. Okay, one is health, a diet, or gym, or exercise. What's the second thing that most people make resolutions about? Finances. Finances. Oh, you guys, are, it's like you guys read my notes. Okay, but, okay, the first one is dieting or gym. The second one is financial stuff, more savings, or they're going to invest in something, or they're going to save more, or they're going to cut down on expenses. What's the third area? No. Okay. <laughs> Relationship goals, food goods. No. The third, according to Google, is religious duties. So people, yeah, that's top three. I'll be more spiritual. I'm going to pray more. I'm going to attend church more, or I'm going to do all these things. So usually, those are the top three. And I remember, this was many, many years ago, when I decided I'm going to go to the gym. So I went to Holiday Gym, holiday gym Inn and Spa, or something like that. Okay. And then uh, the person there said, how much, ang imuang, how much will you pay for? And I said, the whole year. Uh, okay, commitment lagi. And then the person said, sir, are you sure? Don't you want to get maybe one month or two months first or maybe three months trial, yeah, or get the promo? I said, no, no, no. I'm paying for the whole year so that I will force myself to go to the gym. Lo and behold, I lasted for two months. <laughs> After two months, wala well, na. Uh, and then I went to, to the gym and asked for a refund. They said they couldn't refund anymore and they reminded me how they warned me several times not to do it. And so, nasaya. This was many years back. And I realized, Vitao no, I think the reason why is most of the time, these resolutions are emotional. They're usually based on, uh, you know, what we feel we ought to be doing without making a serious check and balance. We don't really think about what it will take. So on my part, when I enlisted in the gym, I never really thought about my schedule my Monday to Friday sked, my Saturday and Sunday sked, what it will require of me, the commitment it will take. For me, it was an emotional thing. So yeah, I'll do it. But emotions don't really last that long. In the spiritual life, because we're a church, we're not going to talk about the gym or diet or health or money or savings. We're going to talk about the third type of resolution, the religious ones. In the spiritual life, again, Google tells me uh, there are top four uh, religious uh, resolutions that people make. The first one now is they will start praying more. That's top one. Top two resolution is attending church. Going to church, and that includes Bible studies, fellowshipping, making sure you're going out with church people and all that. And the third, surprisingly enough, here's the third, that they're going to read the whole Bible from start to finish within a year. That's the top three religious resolutions according to Google. And then there are top three resolutions that they will stop doing down. Top one, uh, no, let's make it from top three and then two and then top one. Top three, or third, sec or second runner-up, is they will stop wasting time. Ah, oh, I'm like, whoa, really, Google, are you sure? that they're going to stop wasting time and they're going to start doing spiritual things. First runner-up is they will stop sinful habits or bad habits. Okay? And the number one resolution that the people will stop doing now, this is all for 2016. Who can take a crazy guess what they're going to stop doing? Google says they're going to stop cursing. Like, whoa! I guess this is American. Okay, Google man siya. But now I want to ask, what does Jesus say? 
about all this? What does Jesus himself say about resolutions? And you know, when Jesus starts talking, you can be sure of two things. Number one, it's going to be very loving. Number two, it's going to be very shocking. That's Jesus' style. He will love you and shock you at the same time. Now let's take a look at what resolve says, uh, what resolve means in the Bible dictionary. A resolve is a decision made before the anticipation, anticipated event based on a weighing of the facts of the case. So a, dis, a resolution is just like a conviction. You've decided beforehand what you're going to do even before many factors happen in the future. That's what a resolution or a conviction is. So we're going to jump into Luke chapter 14, verse 25. But before we start there, I'm going to tell you the context lang. So what's happening during this time? Jesus is now a rock star, okay? He's popular. He's famous. Everybody knows him. He's done so many miracles. The people who were baptized by John the Baptist transferred to him already. A lot of followers of the Pharisees left the Pharisees and they started following Jesus. And so imagine you've got a gigantic crowd of thousands following Christ. So wherever he goes, the crowd follows. They like watching him perform miracles. They like it when he heals the sick, when he multiplies food, and when he preaches, people are always shocked. So he's a very interesting guy to follow. Imagine if Jesus had Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Can you imagine? All the followers clicking, waiting, watching. And here's the thing. Whenever Jesus came up with the Pharisees, sparks fly. There's always tension. And people like watching that. They enjoy the the chismes. Oh, guess what Jesus said? Burn Kayo, you know? So it's very interesting. It's so much fun to follow him. And so at one point, Jesus suddenly spoke to them about what it really means to follow him. Because there's thousands of them. So let's look at Luke chapter 14. We're going to start in verse 25. Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. So he goes straight to the point. And this is very shocking. Does Jesus really want me to hate my parents? That doesn't make sense. Siguro, if we come from different backgrounds, no? some people will probably say, ah, that's so easy. I hate them, they hate me, you know, but most of the time, we have parents who love us, who care about us, who's shown us so much love, so much generosity. How could Jesus say this? How much more to the Jew? Remember, the Jews valued their parents. One of the commandments in the Ten Commandments says, honor your father and your mother. So can you imagine? Moses said, honor your father and your mother. And then Jesus says, if you don't hate your father and mother, you are not worthy. Oh, but Moses said, can you imagine the shock people would feel? So this is bad news for the Jews. Secondly, it also gets even worse because according to the Mosaic law, Children are supposedly a sign or a badge of honor for the parents. So if you had children, remember, huh? this is the agricultural age. The more kids you have, the more people will be help, helping you plow the, you know, the animals and tow the fields and all that stuff. In the agricultural age, the more kids you have, the more free labor you get. Right? So, so now, child labor, no such thing. It's just how the world worked. And so for them, they love their kids because they're very grateful to their kids because their kids are always helping them with the family business, quote unquote. And so when Jesus said, you have to hate your own father and mother and wife and children, that's insane. And then Jesus makes it even worse. Brothers and sisters. Do you guys know the culture of the Middle East when it comes to brotherhood? Once someone calls you a brother, that's not a joke. When we went to Turkey, uh, the ambassador for Turkey, his name's Irfan, he called us our bro his brothers and sisters, and that's not a light thing. 
when he came to my mom's 60th birthday just recently, um, he was talking to me and he was like, oh, I'm so happy we're, we're here again. The whole family is complete. He considered us as family. And he said, you know, we should um, have dinner again one of these days at my home because you're, you're my brother and I'm your brother. And so for them, brotherhood is a very deep bond. And Jesus says, all these deep bonds you must hate. That's, that doesn't make sense. That doesn't sound right. And then he says this, even his own life. You have to hate even your own life. Now that's the worst. That, I think, is the one thing that most people will never understand. Why is it like this? Why did Jesus use such strong words? Remember, Jesus is a master of exaggeration. So what is he really saying? He's saying, your devotion to Christ should be so high that if you compare all the other loves you have in this world, it's like hatred compared to your love for Jesus. So if there's a scale of 1 to 100, your devotion and love for Christ must be 100, and then the next runner-up should score only mga 11 or 10 or 9. And then everything's there na. 11, 10, 9, 8, 7. So the gap should be very, very far apart. There ought to be no competition. There should be no contest. There shouldn't even be a, but Jesus or there shouldn't be a struggle even. How impossible does this sound? Sounds insane. Sounds like no one can achieve this. It sounds impossible. Now look at verse 27. Jesus even continues. He says, Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So he emphasizes the death. Now again, let's go back to the Jewish mind. Ever since Moses, the time of Abraham, to Moses, all the way to right before Christ, the Jews always thought that if God loved you, you will win the war. So for the Jews, I can kill for God. But dying for God? Okay lang in the context of war. But if I'm not supposed to fight back, and I'm just gonna let people kill me for God, for them, that's not really very triumphant. That doesn't sound like a good religion. They're so used to winning wars for God. And to make matters worse, Jesus talks about the cross. The cross before was the penalty for crime. But not just any crime. You know what the cross is really a penalty for? Treason. The cross was actually reserved for people who betrayed the government, who betrayed the law. So it's treason. So this is like our version of the death penalty via, I don't know, maybe electric chair, and then when you're still alive, they'll inject you with poison, something like that. So it's very gruesome, it's very bloody, it's very gory. So why would Jesus say, you should carry your cross? The implication here is that you should love me so much, you're willing to commit treason against every other loyalty in your life. He's saying, if it comes to the point that others will feel betrayed because you love me so much, you have to be willing. This is an insane commitment. It's an impossible resolution. Imagine all the followers who are following Jesus during this time. Oh, I'm a follower. You follow also? Yes, high five, follower. And then Jesus starts talking. Can you imagine how they felt? Oh, this is some hard stuff, Jesus. Like, we're just here because we like watching you. And you make all these cool miracles. And now, cross, treason, death. This doesn't sound like such a good deal. So how is this kind of loyalty comparable to most professing Christians today? There are four other kinds of Christians. There's actually five. The first one is already what we know of, the genuine one who really wants to follow Christ until death. There are four others. Let's count the other four. One's, one is what we call the convenience Christians. I only follow Jesus when it's convenient, when it's easy, when it gives me 
you know, the feels when it's nice. But once it doesn't give me my, uh, you know, what I like to hear and all that, nah, it's getting kind of inconvenient, no thanks na lang. You know, it's kind of too far, too, or too hot, or too inani, no na lang. And I remember when we went to China uh, on a mission trip where the Chinese, the people there, would cross four mountains, two, uh, three provinces, one river, and one lake just to go to church on a Sunday. So they start traveling Saturday night to arrive Sunday morning. And they spend the whole Sunday morning there, whole day. And then at Sunday, 4 p.m., they start traveling back home. And I talk to them, and for them, it's nothing. For them, it's a joy. It's even exciting. It's, it's, they make a, a big deal out of it. It's like a road trip for the family. We're like, oh my goodness. And you know where, we, where they, they would meet? They would meet in the most inconvenient places. So usually, not so much aircon, you know, and the food isn't really that great. But they enjoyed it. And I thought to myself, oh my goodness, I went to China thinking I would minister to them. I come home realizing they're the ones encouraging me. This is the kind of expectation or commitment that's not really convenient. The second kind of Christian is what we call the teddy bear Christians. Why teddy bear? When we say teddy bear, it's something you like to hug, diba? Right? And so teddy bear Christians are people who profess Christ, but really they just like to be hugged. They like to be loved. They go to the church so that people will love them and accept them. So they don't like hard preachings like this. They like it when people say, oh, come as you are. We love you and accept you. And they're like, yes, I'm so loved. And then when someone says, bro, your lifestyle, that, that's, that's sinful. You're not supposed to be doing that. You don't accept me anymore. And they go away. The teddy bear Christians. And then there's a third kind. The itchy-eared Christians. The itchy-eared Christians are people who like to hear what their itching ears just want to hear. This is, this is in First Timothy. So they only go to churches that say good stuff. God wants you to be happy and great and victorious and triumphant. But if, you know, you say, well, what about the apostles? What about those who died for the Lord? That's not God's will for you. Why should it be? God is a God of love. How could He will for you to suffer? These are the itchy-eared Christians. They just go to churches that say nothing but the good stuff. So they never preach. Uh, they never like to hear preachings of Jesus saying, if you follow me, you will go through trials, tribulations. You will suffer for my name. If they hated me, they will hate you. If the world does not know me, they will not know you. And by this, your Father in heaven will be glorified. Nobody wants that promise. That's the itchy eared Christians. The fourth one, interestingly, is the secret agent Christians. What's a secret agent Christian? A secret agent Christian is someone who goes to church, does all the things a Christian is expected to do, but will never share his faith. Why? I don't know. Maybe he's afraid that it will destroy his reputation, ruin his career, destroy his business, or just lose friends. But they will never say anything. Secret agent. Now, I wonder which one Jesus accepts. Look at verse 28. Which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost? whether he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. I think today that's still very common. Have you ever seen those condominiums Yeah, it's not really fully paid? And so they start pre-selling, hoping that they get enough buyers so they have money so they can finish it. So they counted the cost and they know they have not enough money. But they sell. That's a very risky, foolish thing to do. Because if not enough people buy, you won't really have enough to finish the tower 
and then those who bought will default and they will sue you. Right? And then people will laugh at you and you become a laughing stock. But why did God, Jesus, use a tower as an illustration? Remember, he's talking to Jews. If there's 